My talk is on the security analysis of India's new payment service called UPI and the financial apps that use it. This work is a collaboration with Professor Prakash and my colleagues Srish and Haolo. India was predominantly a cash-based economy and while payment apps existed, they were not that popular. Early Indian payment apps were digital wallets, but two users wanting to do a transaction would have to install the same wallet, add money to their wallet, and the payment service provider would do a wallet-to-wallet -wallet transaction, sometimes for a nominal fee. This was the case until 2016. In 2016, the National Payments Corporation of India, backed by the Indian government, launched the Unified Payments Interface, or UPI, to enable free and instant micropayments from a mobile platform. The UPI payment service is nothing but a common backend infrastructure that integrates several financial institutions together to facilitate bank-to-bank -bank transactions. For users wanting to transact using UPI, can install any one of the UPI-enabled apps from Google Play Store and simply add their bank account to it. As of June 2020, there are 155 banks live on UPI and UPI has done 1.3 billion transactions worth 34 billion US dollars. In this research, we conduct a security analysis of UPI 1.0, a complex black box application layer protocol used by several Indian payment apps and its design choices. The makers of UPI have published a few broad guidelines. First off, for a user wanting to use UPI, their primary cell number, which is also UPI's UPI ID, has to be registered with the bank out of band. The UPI guidelines talk about three factors of authentication. The first factor is called as a device fingerprint, which is, which is an association between the cell number and the device information. This association on the server side is called as device hard binding. The second factor is a passcode, which is optional. The first two factors are used for user profile setup. The third factor, which is a UPI pin, is used to authorize transactions. To set up a UPI pin, the user has to provide six digits of a debit card number and expiration date. Now, when we started this research, this is all we knew about the UPI protocol. So we had to uncover the client-server handshake of the protocol step by step and we had to find out what were the credentials required in each step and what attributes were leaked from each step. We also looked for alternate workflows which can be exploited. We triage the findings to determine any plausible attack vectors. To do this, we had to overcome two significant reverse engineering barriers. The first is that the protocol itself was unpublished and we had no backend access to UPI servers. Hence, to analyze the protocol, we had to study the payment apps that integrated with UPI. But these apps were designed with security in mind and evading these app defenses was non-trivial. For instance, these apps were all obfuscated, used encrypted communication, had emulator detection built into it, and also required a physical SIM card to be present on the phone. This deterred dynamic analysis totally. Finally, the UPI apps undergo a thorough security review in India before they are published. As a result of this, our approach to analysis is a combination of static reversing code instrumentation and traffic analysis depending on the defenses built into the app. We study UPI protocol through India's flagship app called Beam. In 2016, Beam was released as a reference impl implementation of a UPI app. We instrumented and repackaged the Beam app to map the GUI of the app with the underlying handshake it generated. And we also confirm our findings on other popular payment apps at that time, like Paytm, PhonePay, etc. We study the Android flavors of these apps because Android was the most popular operating system in India. Next, we look at the UPI 1.0 handshake from an attacker's perspective. We assume the following threat model. We assume any good user that installs Beam from Google Play and uses a properly configured phone. The user also pre prevents unauthorized physical access to his phone. We also assume a good attacker. The attacker uses a rooted phone and can reverse engineer any of the apps. The attacker also releases a useful yet unprivileged Trojan app that somehow makes its way into the victim's phone. 
Now, for the attack to succeed, the victim must have installed the Trojan app. So, is this threat model realistic? According to Google, threat because of potentially harmful applications are very real. 53% of the attacks happen because of pre-installed PHAs on low-cost cell phones and India is in the top three countries with the most number of PHAs pre-installed. Let's now look at how an attacker can attack a user's UPI account that's secured using the device fingerprint and the passcode. We first explain the default workflow of the device hard binding process of UPI, which is the first step in the protocol, and we subsequently show how an attacker can peel through each layer of the protocol to finally launch an attack on its user. First, in the first step, the Beam app on the client's device grabs a user's device details and sends it to the UPI server. The UPI server saves this information and sends a registration token back to the client. In the second step, Beam app on the user's device reads a user's cell phone from the device automatically and sends an SMS containing the token to the UPI server. The UPI server receives the user's cell phone number or caller ID from that particular SMS, verifies the cell number and binds the cell number with the device information and subsequently confirms the binding to the client. From an attacker's standpoint, the step 2 of the protocol which sends an SMS inherently is more secure than a typical OTP based verification. For an attacker to compromise this step, the attacker would have to compromise the protections provided by the cell phone company. But the makers of UPI have provided an alternate workflow which has an inherent weakness. In the event that the step 2 of the protocol fails, UPI's alternate workflow allows an attacker to key in a victim cell number on an attacker's device. This allows an attacker to potentially bind an attacker's device with a victim cell number. An attacker can induce a failure in step 2 of the default workflow by simply turning on airplane mode. Once the attacker keys in the cell number, the cell number and the token is sent as an HTTP message to the UPI server. The UPI server then sends an OTP to the victim. The victim thus receives a rogue OTP. This OTP can be intercepted by the Trojan running on the attacker's device. The Trojan only requires the receive SMS, to per SMS permission to do this. Thus, to break device binding, all an attacker needs is a user's cell number and one OTP from that number. Next, to leak the passcode, the Trojan running on the user's device can simply draw an overlay on Beam's passcode entry screen. The paper talks about a way to do this without requiring additional permissions. The intercepted passcode is sent to the attacker. The attacker enters the passcode at which point the UPI server prompts the attacker to add a bank account. It is important to note here that the passcode is a secret that's shared with the payment server and not the bank. This means that for third-party apps like Google Pay, the passcode is a secret that's shared with the Google payment server and not UPI or the bank. As a result, for an attacker that's wanting to compromise a Google Pay account, can use attacker's credentials to bypass the step of authentication. It is also imperative to note that the attacker is never prompted for any bank-specific secret at any point in the registration workflow. For an attacker wanting to reverse engineer a user's bank account, an attacker can simply start brute forcing through the list of most popular banks that the UPI provides. The UPI server does not appear to prevent brute force attacks. Once the attacker has made the right choice, the UPI server would return the user's bank account number and bank account name and other details back to the attacker. I would like to point out a slight nuance between the workflow of a a uh, user that is setting up UPI for the first time versus the workflow when the user is an existing user of UPI. Once a user enters a password, in the case of a new user, the UPI server asks the user to add a bank account. However, in the case of an existing user, the UPI server simply syncs an existing UPI account onto the user's phone. 
Now, from an attacker standpoint, this is pretty useful because for compromising an existing user, the attacker has to do less work, for one. And secondly, it is possible for an attacker to compromise or to sync a user's existing user's bank account onto the attacker's phone. Let's now see an attack on an existing user. Prior to the attack, the attacker installs a repackaged version of Beam with all the client-side defenses disabled. The attacker also expects the victim's device to be compromised with the Trojan. To start the attack, the attacker must learn of a user's cell number. The paper describes the way the attacker can do this, starting with no knowledge of a user. But that said, the cell number is not really a secret in India. It's widely circulated in shopping malls and restaurants, also in WhatsApp groups. Let's now see the actual attack. On the right side is the victim's cell phone. And the victim has already installed Beam and has a UPI account. The victim enters the passcode. The Trojan intercepts the passcode. That's the bank account of the victim. The Trojan is in the background. On the left is the attacker's device. The attacker is installing Beam for the very first time. Attacker induces a failure in the default workflow, at which point he is prompted to enter the cell number of the victim. The victim gets an OTP. The Trojan intercepts the OTP. The OTP and the passcode is forwarded to the attacker. When the attacker receives the OTP, the cell phone is verified. At this point, the attacker only has to enter the passcode and the victim's account is synced on the attacker device. Once an attacker's user profile is compromised, for the attacker to do a transaction, he requires a UPI pin. What we saw is that the UPI pin can be leaked in the exact same way as a passport. But that said, setting a UPI pin only requires partial debit card details as printed on the card. Transactions in India actually require the complete debit card number and a secret pin that's shared with the bank. However, setting the UPI pin does not require the secret pin, which is a lower bar for India. Unlike mobile wallets, where money may only be lost from the wallet, here, the attacker can completely empty a user's bank account. There are 155 UPI apps and the attacker just needs to compromise or leak information from any one of those apps. To conclude, we uncovered core security vulnerabilities in the workflow of UPI 1.0 and we show how using a Trojan app, an attacker can attack a user's bank account and steal money from him. We disclosed all the vulnerabilities to CERT India and makers of UPI in 2017 and we also contacted all the app vendors. In August 2018, UPI 2.0 was released and we confirmed that in the new version of UPI, they fixed the alternate workflow that we use for our exploit, but the other security holes remain. There are other threat vectors that we could potentially look at to compromise UPI 2.0 such as SMS spoofing or loss of a user's device or compromising the Android system itself. Thus, this calls for a proper security vetting of the proprietary protocol since discussions are now on to make UPI global. Thank you.